Uh, good morning, everybody. If you're here in Hong Kong, uh, welcome. Uh, this is our uh, one of a series of Foreign Correspondents Club Zoom events. Uh, today's event is, is called Fighting the COVID-19 Infodemic, A Matter of Life and Death, uh, where today we'll be looking at uh, the other pandemic going on right now, which is this pandemic of misinformation and fake news that's going around. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's joining in uh, for this Zoom event, and I'll introduce our panelists in a moment. Uh, but I just want you to say, I want to say, please keep an eye out for uh, a series of these FCC Zoom events that we're going to be doing now. Uh, we have another one coming up on Tuesday, August 4th with Suzanne Nussel, and she's going, she's the CEO of PEN America, and uh, she's going to be here uh, on a topic called Dare to Speak, Defending Free Speech for All where she will be looking at uh, the conflict between kind of free speech and, uh, and what so-called cancel culture going on in America. Uh, she's got a new book out. Um, so please look at that for August 4th and keep your eye out on our website for upcoming Zoom events. Uh, go to FCCHK.org. And for today, I can't think of a more interesting and a better topic to be discussing, which is this uh, uh, flood of fake news and misinformation that's been floating around uh, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you've heard much of it yourself. I know I've heard it before. If you drink a glass of water, that might actually kill the, the, uh, the virus. Uh, you know, uh, if you just hold your breath, you can self-test yourself whether you have the virus. We've heard about all kinds of fake cures going around from hydrochloroquine to injecting yourself with bleach. Uh, we're going to break off down a lot of this with our panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Kirsten Urquiza, who's joining us, I believe, from the West Coast of the United States. So we're going to thank her for getting up really at this uh, early hour on the West Coast of the U.S. Uh, she is actually the head of an NGO, a deputy director of Mighty Earth, which is an environmental NGO. But she's really here because uh, she actually started an online uh, site dealing with fake news called Marked by COVID, which he started when her father uh, passed away from the disease in Arizona. We also have with us Claire Wardle. She's the director of First Draft. She's very well known of, of all of us involved in kind of fact checking and trying to debunk fake news. And, uh, and she'll explain how COVID has left her organization confronting this kind of flood of misinformation. And uh, I, will, I will not say last or least, we have Alice Budisatriho, uh, who's coming to us from Singapore. So this is a truly international panel. And she is Facebook's misinformation uh, head for the entire Asia Pacific region. And that includes, I believe, Instagram and WhatsApp. So it's not like she has a very small job uh, to do. And she's gonna tell us a little bit about that and I think have a presentation. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this event that we're going to have Eric Wishart, who is the uh, first vice president here at the Foreign Correspondent Club. But more importantly, he's a very senior journalist with the French news agency, Agence France Press. And they have about 40 uh, fact checking units all over the world. Um, so I want to uh, I want to turn it over to Eric Wishart, who's going to uh, start our presentation here um, and uh, start questioning our panelists. So Eric, thank you, Keith, for the for the introductions. And I think it's actually five o'clock in, in the evening uh, for you, Kristen. So <laughs> it's West Coast time. So um, I would just like to start. Um, First of all, by saying that this is a very timely um, uh, panel, given that the United States has just crossed this terrible threshold of 150,000 dead, and condolences again, uh, Kristen, on your, on, your, on your loss. So I felt it would be appropriate um, to begin with you. And can you just, can you just tell us what happened um, to your father, Mark, and, and just Tell us your, your story and, and how it led up to you deciding to launch this um, campaign called Mark by COVID. Sure. Um, thank you, Eric. And, um, it, you know, really happy to be here to uh, share what my story is um, and my dad's story. Uh, so my name is Kristen Urquiza, and um, my father's name was Mark Anthony Urquiza. Um, I grew up in Arizona. I, I live now in California. Um, I haven't been in, uh, living in Arizona for quite some time, but um, I, you know, I have been following politics in Arizona uh, since leaving, since it's my home and where my family lives. And uh, once the coronavirus um, you know, started to, to jump up on my radar, which was um, actually early January, um, I started to reach out to my parents to talk to them um, about what I was learning um, I have a good friend who's an epidemiologist who studied pandemics. He was actually in West Africa 
during the Ebola crisis. Um, you know, and I've been, you know, very much a, a, a believer in science. Um, and, you know, he was counseling me saying, listen, this is um, very serious and I'm worried about our response. And at that time, you know, we didn't know a lot about it. We're still actually don't know much. We're learning every day. Um, but that alarmed me. And with my mom being 64 and diabetic, I was particularly worried about her health. Um, and so I started counseling my parents. Uh, we had many conversations over the course of February, coming up with a strategy to keep my parents safe. Um, and, you know, I was concerned about the downplaying of the virus from the Trump administration during this time. Um, but as we went into a shelter in place sort of national strategy, you know, state by state, but then overall in lots of places, you know, my parents were on board. They believed it was real. Uh, they, you know, believed that wearing masks were um, an important mitigation strategy. Um, they believed in social distancing. And, um, you know, through the course of March and April, um, we're safe. Uh, my dad was a frontline worker. He worked in manufacturing, so he did still have to go to work to and from, um, but didn't do anything else, any social activities, dinners out, um, any of that type of activity. He was furloughed at the end of April, um, and then May came around, and the president on May 5th actually had his first um, visit out of quarantine, which happened to be to Arizona. Um, on that trip, uh, prior to boarding Air Force One, um, he said something to the extent of, it's important we get our economy open. Um, we might experience some terrible losses, but you know, people in the United States should think of themselves as warriors. And then when he was back in Phoenix, he reinforced uh, that it, the economy needed to open up. Um, within two weeks of that, on May 15th, uh, or 10 days, uh, my, the, uh, the shelter in place order expired. Uh, the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey, he um, basically opened up the entire state without any restrictions. His executive order for reopening also prevented local municipalities from um, actually instating their own safety measures, such as mandating mask wearing. And then he went on a media uh, spritz, uh, spree to really downplay the impacts or the effects or the potential um, uh, risk of coronavirus. Um, he is on record as late as May 28th saying, if you don't have an underlying health condition, it's safe to be out there. Go out shopping, take a loved one to a restaurant, catch up with a friend. My dad took this message to heart and it ended up being a death sentence for him. Two weeks after that radio interview, my dad woke up with a fever and a cough with extreme exhaustion. My mother called me saying, I've never seen your father this sick before. She told me what was going on. I said, mom, it sounds like he has COVID. My dad ended up passing away on June 30th which was just two and a half weeks after that. He was alone in his room in the ICU with a stranger holding his hand and he did not deserve that ending. And neither did the 150,000 people who have now passed away in the United States. Okay. So I think, um, Kirsten, we'll come back to you on, on, your, on the movement that you started and following that, but maybe um, Claire, could you could you explain um, what is first draft? You, you, it's been in existence, I think, now for five years. So, could you give us first of all a bit of background on on the actual organisation? Yeah. Yeah. So, I just want to say, Kristen, I'm so sorry for your loss. I actually lost my grandma to COVID in March. Um, so May. So, it just to hearing you say that is yeah. a reminder <laughs> of we can yeah. talk about all this stuff, but actually, she was mm -hmm. in a nursing home. And they weren't wearing masks because they didn't want to upset the patients with dementia because there was no way of people saying mask, mask work. So it's in, yeah. the, reason, the reason that we do the work that we do is because this stuff is making a difference mm -hmm. um, to people's lives. So Fast Draft, we existed for five years and our job is to help newsrooms figure out what's true or false online. How do you verify what to believe? And in the last five years, it's gone from a few hoaxers, you know, 
having a laugh, seeing what they can do, to a flood of misinformation in a way that I could never have dreamed possible, even as a researcher who was, you know, this has kind of been my work for the last 10 years. Um, so we work with newsrooms, but we increasingly work with health authorities. We work with the public um, because actually we've just failed. And in the US context, after 2016, we saw what happened in the Philippines. We saw what happened with Brexit. We saw what happened with the US election. And all of a sudden there was all of this money that flooded in. We had convenings, we talked about it. And we're three months out from the US election in the middle of a pandemic. And we are in a much worse situation than we've been in, than I've seen in the last four years. So, you know, we do trainings, we run simulations to try and prepare newsrooms. We build, you know, we've look, just launched an SMS course. We do everything that we possibly can. And I get up every day and I work 15 hours trying to make a difference, but it's really hard when this flood is coming over us. And I just, I think going back to the, the experience that Kristen and I have both had, up until now, the funders have only really cared about election disinformation. And you talk to the public about it and they're like, oh, it's just politicians doing the usual stuff. But actually, health misinformation is a completely different situation. This is real world harm leading to people losing their lives. It's having serious effects. And I think the one tiny silver lining in all of this horror is that at least we're starting to have conversations about how do we take misinformation seriously. This isn't a side project anymore. We have to wake up and recognize that this is doing serious harm globally. And I, this is not an easy problem to fix, but we, we can't pretend that this isn't affecting the way we think about climate, the way we think about health, the way we think about cancer cures, the way we think about democracy, the, whether or not we trust the news, it's affecting everything and it's, it's serious. Where does health fit into the kind of top 10 topics that are, are, are the target of, of disinformation, misinformation? Is it the number one thing now globally or? Yeah, so I mean, I would say, you know, I often do kind of conferences and panels on this and I would always say in the US, there is a disproportionate focus. This is before COVID. This was up until, you know, end of last year, I'd say there's a disproportionate focus in the US on political disinformation on Facebook. Globally, the problem is, is health and science misinformation on closed messaging apps. And so there's that that difference. And I think that America has woken up now or the US to the fact that actually health and science misinformation is also something that people need to take seriously. And all of a sudden funders are like writing checks. It's like, where were you before? Like this, we should have known that this was a problem and that we weren't prepared. Okay. So Alice, um, obviously Facebook, huge platform, a lot of misinformation is shared on it. So I think you have some slides to, to show how you're fighting it. And, um, and your specific uh, brief is Asia Pacific, right? Yes. That's so, right, Eric. do you want to share the your? Do you want to do your presentation and? Uh, sure. Let me just start uh, sharing my screen here. Okay. Let me see if you. Let yep. me know if you can see this. Okay. Great. Just need to. Yep. Okay. You can see that. Great. Uh, well, first, I just also want to start with uh, extending my condolences to Kristen. I'm very sorry for your loss. Uh, I'm I'm based here in Singapore, but I'm actually from Indonesia. So my family is still in Jakarta. And uh, it's certainly something that we're, you know, all worried about because the cases there are also, you know, quite uncontrollable with the way the government is handling the situation and everything. Um, and so that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to have this opportunity, um, Eric and the FCC Hong Kong uh, to talk about a little bit about what uh, Facebook as a company has been doing since the beginning of this pandemic. Because um, essentially when we start, started hearing about this global you know, health uh, crisis, uh, we realized that we have a responsibility to help people not just uh, connect them with information, accurate information, reliable information uh, about this global health crisis, but also to limit the spread of misinformation. And so we work, we've work. we been working very closely with the WHO and other health authorities uh, since then. Um, and so today uh, I specifically just wanna share about um, how we connect people to this uh, accurate information and limit, uh, and limit the spread of misinformation. Although there are other things that we're doing as well, in particular with uh, governments, uh, local businesses and communities all over the world, uh, because we know that our services are being used uh, really to you know, help people get through 
uh, all these social distancing and when businesses cannot uh, actually open you know their their physical stores but uh, they can use our services to try to keep uh, some of their businesses going uh, but today this is uh, what what I'll focus on so I'll start with uh, the work and the products uh, that initiatives that we've been launching <coughs> using uh, all our uh, apps Facebook uh, Instagram WhatsApp and Messenger uh, so first we have this uh, Facebook COVID-19 information center uh, this is something that every so often you will see at the top of the news feed uh, and this contains uh, things like the latest news uh, on COVID-19 uh, in various countries uh, the latest information from the uh, global health authorities like the WHO and the CDC uh, in the US, uh, real-time updates, uh, the latest uh, con number of confirmed cases uh, and things. So basically to like a one-stop shop for people to find out more information, reliable information from uh, the authoritative sources uh, on these issues. And then we have messenger partnerships in India, Indonesia, Philippines. These are some of, some of the uh, Asia Pacific countries uh, that are mentioned here. And what this does is governments in these countries launch a chatbot on Messenger. So basically uh, people can uh, contact the government the, or the health authorities in these countries to find out the latest information about the disease uh, through, Messenger, uh, through Messenger chat. Uh, and the same thing with WhatsApp uh, as well. So with WhatsApp, we also have uh, fact checking, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit later. In some countries, we have fact checkers who use uh, WhatsApp for people to be able to co uh, contact them, to ask about the rumor that they find on WhatsApp or other platforms, uh, and they can find the uh, reliable information from the fact checkers. And we also do a lot of training sessions with local governments and health organizations to help them use our uh, services to connect to people, to spread uh, the reliable information to as many people as possible uh, in their countries. And similarly on Instagram, I just want to highlight a couple of things. So search resources here are also, uh, are actually on Instagram and Facebook as well. So what this does is when people search the most common keywords about the coronavirus, you know, COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, then the first results that people will see are actually links to the CDC in the US or the WHO. So people can see the latest information uh, from the authoritative sources. Uh, top of feed information is essentially the COVID-19 information hub. Uh, and then we also update account recommendations. So this is really to make sure that uh, we only recommend authoritative sources to people uh, and we, you know, uh, we remove organizations' accounts that are less reliable from recommendations. So through all this work of directing people to this reliable information, we have connected more than 2 billion people uh, to content from the WHO, the CDC, and other health authorities. And then more than 300 million, more than 350 million people actually click through to learn more. So this, I think, you know, just goes to show uh, how much we can actually spread reliable information through our services. So now I'll get into on how we limit misinformation and harmful content uh, on the platform. So I know Eric, uh, Claire, and some of you are probably quite familiar with how uh, we handle misinformation, but I'll get into just very at the very high level about how we tackle misinformation on the platform. So we have this three pillar framework, remove, reduce, inform that we use. So remove is uh, we remove all content that violate the Facebook community standards. And Facebook community standards, which is, you know, we essentially our policy, uh, covers a lot of harmful content like hate speech, nudity, uh, terrorism, bullying and harassment. So all of these content, uh, all of these things are not allowed on Facebook. So whenever we see them, uh, we remove them uh, from the platform. We also remove fake accounts. And I want to highlight fake accounts because it's very important, a lot of people who spread misinformation are people who are not using their real names and photos, you know, their ident real identities on Facebook. And so we are actually able to identify fake accounts increasingly you know, via automation. So I think in the last uh, quarter, we removed some 1.7 billion fake accounts on the platform. 
and 99% of them before anyone reported it to us. So we detected it automatically. And the more we can, the more we can improve our detection system for fake accounts, it also has a lot of, a big impact on limiting the spread of misinformation. Uh, the second is reduce and, oh, sorry. Before that, uh, under the community standard, we also remove misinformation that could lead to real world harm. So that means misinformation that has the potential to get people to be, uh, to, to lead to violence or physical harm uh, to people. But for a lot of other misinformation, misinformation that don't quite risk real world harm, but still obviously misleading, uh, what we do is we work with third party fact checkers. So first draft is ob obviously one of them. Um, and when a fact checker rates content false, we reduce the distribution on Facebook or we downrank it on the newsfeed, which means a lot fewer people will see that content. And then the next thing is we also show uh, debunking articles. So we inform people by showing the uh, more the, the, the accurate version of the story that they're seeing. Uh, we also show people warning labels when they try to share that content or they have shared it in the past. Um, and we also reduce uh, that. Uh, so when a page or an account shares misinformation repeatedly, we also reduce uh, their distribution at the account level. So everything that they post will have limited distribution. Now, I mentioned that we remove misinformation that could lead to uh, imminent physical harm. So in the context of COVID-19, uh, the kind of harm that we want to prevent is when people believe in that misinformation that they will be more likely to get sick or infect others or uh, not get the right treatment. And so because of that, and based on our consultation with the health authorities, uh, we come up with specific categories. So false cures, false, tre false treatments, false prevention, you know, misinformation about the severity of the outbreak. So content that fall under these categories, we remove uh, from the platform. And then some additional measures that we do um, you know, to, to limit the spread of misinformation. So like I said, we work with uh, fact checkers uh, to debunk these claims. At this point, we have 60 fact checking partners covering 50 languages uh, around the world. Uh, we work with the IFCN, the International Fact Checking Network, uh, on a $1 million grant program to help uh, improve the capacity of the fact checkers around the world who have been working, you know, very, I think there's like a, you know, uh, increase of uh, volume of work that they have to do since the beginning of this pandemic as well. And another million dollar uh, grant we give uh, through WhatsApp for the fact checkers in, in some countries to use WhatsApp uh, to take that, to essentially crowdsource uh, misinformation from the public. Um, so through our work with the fact checkers, we have, I think in the month of April alone, we put 50 million uh, warning labels on, on 50 million pieces of content. And that's thanks to about 7,500 debunking articles that our fact checkers have written. And the reason why we're able to do this is because for every content that is fact checked, we kick off a, a similarity detection method to find duplicate content or content that are essentially uh, uh, saying the same thing as the content that is already fact checked. And we apply the labels on the duplicate contents. And then uh, we use those, all the false rated articles to feed uh, the machine learning, uh, to, to feed the data into the machine learning so that we can improve our uh, ability to detect potential false news uh, even more. And we know that these warning labels work because 95% of the time, people who see the warning labels don't click through or don't watch the video if it's a video. So I think I'll stop right there and then uh, I'm happy to take any questions later. Okay, thanks. You can stop the screen share. Yep. Okay. Okay. Benny, oops, look at the. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, there you go. Okay, we're good. So, Tristan, and I think it's going to be a month. Uh, well, it's the, it's today actually in Hong Kong. It's a month since your dad yeah. passed. So, yeah, very sad anniversary. But um, so, can you tell us what happened 
afterwards, and, and we, we've spoken before, you, you then discovered not only did he get this, this kind of message from the governor, but also you discovered his, his social media use as well, I think. And, and so can you talk, talk us through what, what led you to starting Mark by COVID and, and how it's been progressing? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, in the weeks leading up to my dad's uh, illness, you know, he and I had multiple conversations about, you know, what he should and shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, my dad, you know, reiterated, re reiterated to me, you know, Kristen, if it's not safe to be out there now, why would, you know, the governor be saying it's state safe? Why would the president be saying it's safe? And it, was reinforced, um, you know, on his social media channels. He was a avid Facebook user and, you know, now, you know, as his legacy contact and, you know, going back and looking through his newsfeed, um, which I've done, it's just kind of overwhelming to see the misinformation that, you know, was, that is there right now. Um, you know, I, I know. Well, well, Tristan, what was he looking at actually? What specific kind of content did, did he have? <laughs> yeah, I mean the content. A lot of a lot of the content is uh, memes, but then also like unverifiable, you know, news sources. Which you know, to my trained eye, I could tell is absolutely fake news. But to my dad, who you know had a high school education um, and you know was a first generation, um, you know, from immigrant parents from Mexico, who you know his first language was English didn't quite have the same set of skills that I had to really discern um, the difference between, you know, a, a reputable news site and a non-reputable news site. Um, the, you know, when my dad got sick um, and then subsequently passed, uh, you know, a month ago now, I felt two things, uh, grief, um, sadness, you know, the tra traditional thought feelings, but also an incredible rage um, that was so powerful because of these series of conversations that I'd had with him, knowing that his death was totally preventable. It should not have happened. And I knew that I needed to do something about it or it, knowing that it wouldn't bring back my dad, but recognizing that, you know, I, had borne witness to this terrible tragedy, this heart-wrenching loss, and then the subsequent sickness and just having a loved one in the hospital is, a, a, for, with COVID specifically right now, I equate to a living nightmare. I didn't wish it upon my worst enemy. And so I knew I needed to speak out. And so in the aftermath of my dad's passing, I launched Marked by COVID. Um, my dad's name was Mark, so it's a little bit of a nod by him, but we're also um, really looking to connect with people to share their, their stories, either their stories of loved ones that they've lost, their own personal story with COVID, or in another way that they've been impacted or marked by COVID, whether they're an essential worker or something else. And uh, through our platform, we are doing two things, one, collecting stories and really helping to personify the loss here in the United States. But we're also fighting back against the misinformation of coming specifically from, you know, the Trump administration and others about, um, you know, the, the risk mitigation uh, strategies and uh, speaking out. And, you know, in the last few weeks, we've had an o overwhelming <laughs> outpouring of support, people coming forward, sharing their stories. Um, you know, I, I will say, you know, anecdotally, a, a lot of these people seem to be around my age who are working with uh, parents who are a little bit, you know, in their 60s, a little bit older. And it is an uphill battle because we can't compete against the megaphone um, that some of these leaders have, which is completely muddling the message of what we need to be doing. Claire, um... When you look at how people consume this, um, <clears throat> I think Mark was 65, right? Kristen, your dad was 65, yeah. Yep. Um, which is my age. 
and um, and I have friends, acquaintances on Facebook. The same baby is it, I think we fall into the baby boomer generation, um, who share this stuff. And I mean, one person in particular, as a as an exercise, he he, he last week he he posted a, like a thirty word meme, something like Anthony Fauci served on the board of Microsoft, uh, just saying kind of crazy stuff, as if there's some conspiracy there. And I sent him three fact checks from AP Reuters, I think AFP, and um, and then it's all PolitiFact saying this is not true. He, he he worked with the Gates Foundation, but he was never on the board of Microsoft. And he just dismissed it. He says, oh, who are these fact checkers? What's their motivation? So he will believe a 30 word meme over three major international news agencies and PolitiFact. So, so I don't know if this, this, if it's generational. I mean, how do you analyze that, Claire, from your experience of, of trying to beat this? I mean, how do, you, how do you, if three or four fact checks can't change somebody's mind over a 30, 35 word meme, um, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we have to recognize is it's very easy to look at people who are believing falsehoods and to say, they're crazy, this is nuts. Like, why don't they believe the science? What we have to recognize is right now, most, almost, almost nobody in the world is untouched in some way, that their lives have been turned upside down. And they are seeking an explanation to make sense of the fact that, you know, they've been at home for five months, they've lost family members, they don't know when they can next go on holiday. I mean, just a level that we couldn't even imagine six months ago. And so when, as a human, you're in that mode, you're looking for explanations and you're looking for a feeling of self-efficacy. You're looking for a sense of control. And when we still don't have an origin story of where the virus came from, there's still debate about how it spreads, if it's airborne or not. The WHO still hasn't agreed. And we still haven't got a treatment. What we're looking for is those explanations. And conspiracy theories give to people that self sense of self-efficacy. Well, it must all be connected because Fauci once did like that because it gives us as humans that, that sense of power. And so we have to recognize why people are vulnerable. And we have to recognize, and I say that as a kind of an academic or a researcher or a journalist, we like to think people have rational relationships to information. We all, doesn't matter if it's left or right, we all have emotional relationships to information. And we seek out and we consume and we share information that reinforces our worldview because that's a very human response. So when, you know, it's great to hear all the things that Facebook is doing. It's great. I mean, just for a fact check, we're not a fact checker uh, that works with Facebook, just for the record. But there are many, many great fact checkers that are doing this work. But in that, when we think about that relationship, this idea that we can beat emotion with facts just doesn't work. And so the challenge is how do we make this material that's around science engaging? How do we do that? And there was another question here that was perfect, which is, it's very difficult in 2020 as humans to believe that something this powerful we can't control or explain. And so it, in that context, we want that simple explanation, um, but that, it, that simply doesn't exist. So again, this is left, right, uh, it's very hard to explain. So what we should have said back in January is, we know nothing about this virus. It's been around two weeks. It's like a bushfire. Right now it's on fire here. Tomorrow it might be here, 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 and I can't tell you where the fire's going, but stay with me and know that the more we learn about the fire, we will tell you as soon as we know. And we failed to do that with COVID. We pretended that we knew everything. And that's caused the situation that we're currently facing where people are like, well, in March, people told us not to wear a mask. What we should have said, well, in March, we think it surfaces. We were wrong, it turns out. And that's how science works and knowledge accumulates. But scientists fail to explain their process in the same way as journalists have been terrible at explaining their process. And both those things have kind of collided right in this moment. And it's why we're as screwed as we are. But I d we can't keep talking about facts as a way to get our way to get ourselves out of this. We have to realize that we're human, irrespective of how educated we are, how old we are, and what political persuasion we are. But do you think that particular generation is more susceptible to disinformation, misinformation? Well, we only, have research, we only have research from the US, but in the US, the people who are most likely to share misinformation are white men over 60. Okay. And so when people say, I'm worried about the kids, I'm not actually that worried about the kids because on Instagram, if you want to say this hasn't been manipulated, you say hashtag no filter. Young people are actually used to manipulation. My mom has only ever known gatekeepers. She could not right. imagine a situation that somebody would lie to her. And so Facebook looks really fancy on my mom's fancy phone. Why would she not trust that? And that's what we need to really think deeply about. 
um, is how do we talk to one another about the way that misinformation affected our communities? How do we be empathetic with each other as opposed to, hey, Uncle Bob, you're stupid. You just posted that conspiracy theory. Let me share a PolitiFact article with you. Because what we share is linked to our identity. So your uncle suddenly feels shamed. What you should be saying is like, hey, Bob, I saw you shared that. Like, I'm really worried about the impact this kind of stuff is having on our community and on our families and on our neighborhoods. Like, I'd love to talk to you about how we get through this because this is really worrying me. We should be using language that's we, us, our, as opposed to, hey, you're wrong, let me publicly shame you. But we're not having those conversations. We talk about media literacy and training young people, but there's so much more we should be doing mm -hmm. amongst different generations. Mm -hmm. Alice, um, I mean, Tristan said that she saw all the conspiracy theories, whatever, fake information on her dad's Facebook feed. So how do you answer that? Is it, you know, is it like, you know, the proverbial finger in a dam and then it's just going to kind of, you, you, is it just a tsunami of disinformation that you can't handle? I mean, what, what's your assessment of it? I mean, you're doing a lot, but, you know, do you feel it's effective or is it making a difference or is it a specific problem in the United States, for example? How do you, how do you break it down? Well, I definitely think it's not a specific problem to the United States. Uh, th I think this, this stuff goes around everywhere around the world. I mean, the reason why we come up with the specific categories of false cures, false prevention, false treatment that I mentioned is because these are the kinds of things that the health authorities are telling us are the most harmful, right? If people believe in these things and they take the wrong drugs or they you know, follow the wrong precautions to prevent getting the virus, then I think the, you know the harm is, is is imminent, and that's why for that kind of stuff we remove. Uh, but for other you know conspiracy theories about how the virus started, uh, you know what Bill Gates has done, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, luckily we do have this uh, network of fact checkers, and they've been fact checking a lot of this stuff. And like I said, you know, uh, 50 million pieces of content have been rated false uh, thanks to these debunking articles. Uh, and there's a lot more that we do um, every day, but obviously we, we can't get to every single content. And that's why we also do uh, digital literacy. And I know that, you know, obviously that there's a, uh, the, the impact of that, you know, cannot change the way people see these things uh, overnight, but it is, I think, important for us to tackle these issues from uh, various, various angles, right? Because and uh, I agree with Claire that when, when it comes to digital literacy, we don't just focus on young people. We focus on, uh, you know, obviously older people uh, in, in my country, in Indonesia, uh, housewives, women are, you know, identified as, you know, some of the big spreaders of misinformation as well. And we have programs uh, to address them as well. So I think if we tackle this from, from uh, different problems and also uh, we have this, uh, uh, initiative to correct the record, which means that for people who have engaged with the kind of misinformation, the COVID misinformation that we have removed uh, from Facebook, we actually show this prompt, this link uh, at the top of their feed, again, to direct them to uh, information from uh, reliable sources. And if they don't believe it, I mean, at this point, there's not much we can do about that. But like I said, I think coupled with programs to uh, help you know, to, to, to improve their digital literacy, uh, to make it easier for people to contact fact checkers through Messenger, WhatsApp, and all the rest of it. Hopefully, in the end, I think there will be a bigger impact down the line. Kristen, um, is there anything you would want to ask Alice, as someone who's been through this, I mean, you, 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 about Facebook and its policy? I mean, I think one of the things that I have been following you know, outside of, of this work is just, it seems like Facebook has uh, resisted, you know, heavily any sort of regulation of it as a news agency. And like, I think that part of what concerns me about some of the social media platforms is that they operate in countries that have, you know, some countries that have such a small budget in comparison to the amount of money that Facebook has. So like, how can these places help keep their people safe if there's an entity operating in them that one wants to, you know, not be regulated at all. And then two just has such a larger 
uh, purse string than say a place like Sri Lanka or other places around the world that are really, really small. Um, so yeah. Alice? I think actually our CEO Mark has said that we welcome some regulation on uh, har harmful content. But I think when it comes to misinformation, it's, it's difficult because, you know, in order, to, in order for a company like Facebook to action misinformation, then we essentially have to assess the veracity of the content, right? And as a private company, we don't think that we should be the arbiter of truth. Uh, and that's why we have to work with independent fact checkers. Uh, and, you know, what we do is we essentially take action based on uh, their ratings um, on, on content. But when it comes to other harmful content, like hate speech, nudity, um, you know, uh, uh, terrorism, you know, content, I think we do work very closely with regulators. We work with um, a lot other uh, tech platforms as well to make sure that, you know, there, there, to make sure that there is a, a standard that can be followed so that we, we make sure that this, this kind of content is not on the platform. I have a question from Richard Ward, and he said, many news organizations allow anonymous reader comments. Doesn't this help spread disinformation? I mean, and I think that opens the, the wider question of, of online anonymity when it comes to the platforms and, and, and social media accounts. So, so Claire, do you have a, a view on that one? Yeah, it's tough because I agree. I think there's this idea that um, if everybody had to use their real name, people would behave better. And we know this from trolls, that when people find out who their mums are and they contact their mums, they very quickly go, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't, I shouldn't have done that. Um, but I do worry a little bit about taking away that anonymity because there are certainly people in certain parts of the world where anonymity is important. I mean, I think maybe on newspaper sites, you know, increasingly people make you log in because they want to collect your data. And, and I think there is something about uh, standing behind your views. But I think this, I mean, there are some people who come to me and say, well, if everybody had a, like a blanket ID and you had a digital ID that could verify who you are, it would solve all our problems. This is complex, you know, and like Facebook is a global organization and they're very different positions. I mean, I'm European, uh, but I live in the US. It was only when I moved to the US, I was like, wow, that First Amendment, people really stand behind it. Like from a European context, I'm much more likely to say, hang on, I think we should take this down. Like I, I want more regulation because I'm European, but I get shouted down in the US and I've started to really recognize, you know, what does it mean, the power of being able to have freedom to, to speak. But I think we also have to recognize that freedom of expression in an algorithmic world isn't necessarily the same because algorithms are deciding whose voice gets heard. So it's, it's complex. But I think one thing I'd say about this is as a society, we often say, what should the platforms do? What should governments do? And we very rarely say, what role does the public have in this? And I actually think we should be more vocal about saying, I don't want to live in a world where the, the key places where people get their information is controlled by corporate entities. And there isn't an ability to like say what I want or don't want. There's not independent researchers working out whether or not the public sphere is being impacted. Because I think, I mean, I am very sympathetic to the platforms in terms of this is hard, like the scale by which you're working, the number of languages, but we have policy guidelines, which is does this atom of content break a Facebook policy or a Twitter policy or a Google policy? Yes, no, stays up, gets taken down. But what we don't have is research on the longitudinal effect of like the drip, 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 drip of misleading conspiratorial content over time. And I worry the historians will look back and be like, wowzers, they had a 20 year period there where they didn't realize what they were unleashing. And I, I think that's, again, I'm, my background is a researcher, but I worry that we don't have the data in able to understand what the type of speech that we're talking about on this call might have to society's long term, which is why I think the public should be part of these conversations. We shouldn't dismiss this as frivolous social media. This is key to what we understand, what we know, and what that means in terms of our own behaviors, who we vote for, how we think about each other. So it is critical. So I have a question from Keith Richburg sitting beside me, who's um, head of the Hong Kong University Journalism School and a very distinguished former foreign correspondent for the Washington Post. And he says, how, how, and, and it, it also comes back to Kristen's situation with her dad, is how hard is it to correct disinformation when, when it's being spread by elected officials like the governor of Arizona or even the president of the United States or any other president for that matter. So I don't know who, but Alice, how do you, how, 
You know, it's one thing um, taking down something posted by just a random conspiracy theorist, but what do you do when it's the President of the United States or the Governor of Arizona? What's, your, what's the Facebook policy on elected officials, for example? Well, we do have a policy not to fact check uh, politicians. So while fact checkers can, as I said, rate uh, content uh, and then we take action based on their ratings, uh, when it comes to politician, it's actually out of scope uh, for fact checking. And that's because we believe that people should know, know uh, when their politicians lie. Because, and like I said, the actions that we take on a piece of content that is rated false is we also reduce the distribution of that content and we cover that content with a strong warning label so people don't even see uh, the image that comes uh, with that content. So all of that, we think that if we allow fact checkers to rate content, content from politicians false, then essentially we will be censoring the speech of that politician. And we don't believe that as a private company, we should be doing that. And a lot of people, I think, do not want private companies to be doing that as well. I mean, people learn about how much politicians lie every day on the media and politicians, I think, and this is the difficulty about um, political misinformation compared to health misinformation, right? With misinformation, like a health misinformation, like I said, we rely on the health authorities to tell us what is true and what's false. Whereas with political misinformation, you know, politicians exaggerate their uh, abilities and their opponents' weaknesses all the time, and we don't want to get in the middle of that. But our policies, our community standard, which covers misinformation that could lead to real-world harm, that applies to everyone, including politicians. So if politicians post, you know, a false cure about COVID-19, we remove that content as well. Okay. Because Twitter has flagged some of President Trump's tweets. Right. You, uh, yeah. Recently, yeah. Um, Claire, you're nodding. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that there, there, there are these interventions, like, for example, as Alice said, like the correct the record, Twitter's adding labels. But we don't actually have any independent research about what, what happens when Twitter adds that label. Does it cause an effect that more people go and look for it? Do people share it with a poop emoji? Do people share it with their friends and family and say, be careful, this isn't true. So I just, I'm, I'm glad that we're seeing more interventions. I would just love to see some independent research into what the consequences are of these kind of interventions. Um, so that's, that's why I was nodding because I really believe strongly in that. And Tristan, I mean, you've been in the front line of this, 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 this information, or wrong information from elected officials. What's, what do you think? The, do you think the platforms should be more um, hands-on when it comes to this? Um, I mean, it's a big question. I mean, with you know my own personal case, um, all I can say is that you know my dad believed what the president in his office as the president of the United States was saying, and I couldn't compete with that. And I think it's really important that. We recognize, um, going to what Claire was saying earlier, that you know information is emotional, and my dad had an emotional connection to the president, and so what he said, my dad believed. Um, I think that's an important um, distinction for us to to recognize that my dad also believed that I'm one of the smartest people that he knew, but he couldn't hear me above the president. Did he watch Fox News? Yes, he was an avid watcher of Fox News. And how much of this did he get from Fox News? Oh, I mean, he had the TV on 24 hours a day. Um, so Fox News was his number one station. Claire, we had a, 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 I mean, just a textbook example this week of this, this it's almost convergence between disinformation spread by the President of the United States, by Breitbart, by um, so-called physicians. Could you explain a bit what actually happened? Um, I mean, it just brought it into focus again. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, when was it? 48 hours ago, there were a group of uh, doctors wearing white coats uh, that gave a press conference on the steps of the Supreme Court in DC. Uh, these are doctors that have uh, worked previously with the Trump administration and on those steps that was live streamed by Breitbart, they were talking about hydroxychloroquine, that there was lots of evidence that it really did work. 
um, you know, they, they said a number of things that were just palpably false. And it was like, we need to open up the America, quarantine measures need to stop. Um, oh, and it, 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 yeah, well, you know, masks don't work. And it, and it went absolutely gangbusters in a way that, I mean, it was eye-watering to us as we watched this. And, and as quickly as the platforms were taking it down, you know, it would end up on another platform like BitChute. And then people would be sharing the bit shoot links back onto Facebook. I mean, it's, I mean, that's why I say there's I have sympathy with the platforms, but the, you know, Madonna, I can't even, I'm mm -hmm. a big Madonna fan. I'm very upset about it, but like Madonna, she reshared it. Uh, Trump retweeted it. So did his son. I mean, the, the scale of influencers taking those messages seriously and they were doctors wearing white coats. So going back to, you know, as humans, we're looking for heuristics because our brains are overloaded and we're looking for these mental short cuts that help us judge credibility well it turns out people standing on the steps of the supreme court wearing coats saying they're doctors like who would blame somebody for believing that and they're saying to you what you want to hear which is this isn't as bad as everybody's saying don't worry we can get back to normal i mean such seductive messaging and then you have influencers sharing it but the scale at which this traveled across all platforms and yes lots of actions taken by the platforms relatively quickly but it's still up in all sorts of places. If I go for a Google, I can find it immediately. The media talks about it. So we've got this huge amplification. It was a massive media event. And, you know, one of, one of my friends who's a disinformation reporter for NBC last night just tweeted, I'm sick and tired of writing the same story every single week. A viral video full of misinformation, getting shared widely, the platforms take action. You know, mm -hmm. this is happening again and again. And so how do we get out of that cycle? Because it works. Like if I'm a bad actor and I want to push certain messaging, there is a playbook. And we've all watched it. We know how to do it. And so I think the next three months in the US are going to be brutal. Uh, and I've watched this country tear itself apart. And uh, misinformation is part of it. I mean, there's been some very good questions here around uh, the role of politicians, how that intersects with misinformation in a divided country. It's going to get pretty nasty, I think, the next few months. Alice, what's the, when something, I mean, I know Facebook acted on that. Um, how long does it take you? What's your reaction time? If there's a piece of content going viral that's obviously potentially harmful, what's your reaction time, and, and what's the decision process actually? Who's who's in who's in the chain of of decision making to 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 act on it? Well, with any potentially harmful uh, content that's posted on the platform, we use the combination of automation and human reviews to uh, decide, you know, what what to do with that content, right? Um, and so, and you know, we, it goes against our policy again. So if it violates the policy, then we remove it. Uh, if it's if it doesn't violate the policy and it's it's, it's potential misinformation, like I said, then we send uh, to the fact checkers. Uh, when it comes to this frontline uh, video, it did violate the policy, and that's why we remove it. Uh, and we look for uh, other content that are duplicates, you know, of the uh, original content that we assess. Obviously, it does take time because these videos were then posted. So I think the original, there's some, or one of the original videos are like three hours long. And then there are two minute, five minute, you know, snippets of the video were posted uh, all over the place. So it does take time for the technology to be able to detect uh, these things and to, you know, to eventually take it down. But, uh, but yeah, if it, if it, if it violates, you know, we, we certainly take it down. And then also, um, the the automation then send that video to the fact checkers anyway, even though it violates our policy, right? So a lot of the fact checkers have actually uh, rated it. So you will see that some of the videos that stay on the platform, they actually have the false news labels on it. So people will know that this is this is false news. But just as a quick example, like we found some in, um, I think from Mexico, where people are basically filming another phone where they're playing the video on their phone and they don't use any of the keywords. So again, like thinking about how do you automate this process? Like people understand how to keep up on these platforms and they use all these different techniques or they edit out the bits that they know break the policy guidelines and put it up onto TikTok. I mean, it's, once you, once you do this all day, you realize that these tactics are actually, it's, it's not just whack-a-mole, it's much, much more difficult than right. that. Um, got a question from Judy Schneider, who's the president of the FCC and the senior international correspondent in Hong Kong for uh, Bloomberg. And, and she wanted to ask uh, Kristen, coming back to my, by COVID, I mean, how, how, you said the response has been good. Um, do, you, do you sense, she wants to know, what is the reaction being? Are, do people want to deal with this? Are they aware of this misinformation um, 
this danger from misinformation and and has what happened to your dad has it had a an effect that that has raised awareness of the, the need to get quality information how how successful do you think you've been so far and and what are you going to do taking taking it forward sure no i appreciate that i mean we we're super new we're only a month old but you know we have connected and i've connected with um literally thousands of people through social media who um, have said a couple of things one um the themes i'm seeing is thank you for speaking up um overwhelmingly people have been saying thank you for speaking up and then i've also been um, getting also a, a ton of folks coming forward and saying this happened to my parents as well and i did not know what to do but you've shown me something effective to do to channel my my disappointment, my rage, my, um, my, my, my frustration with this system and wanting for, you know, this to stop. And so the beginning signs of this, I'm seeing, um, positive momentum towards, um, you know, basically a grassroots movement. Um, that's one of the things that I've been, uh, really, uh, talking about over the course of the last couple of weeks of people here in the U S in particular are fed up. Um, with what they're hearing and are ready to figure out how to move forward. And I think that part of what I've been doing of speaking out has been helping to show people a way. Um, one of the things that we have right on the horizon is a day of action on August 13th, which would have been my dad's 66th birthday. And so we're helping folks um, share their stories on that day and, and working to amplify. So we've only got up two or three minutes left. So I would just like to go around the conversation and maybe from each of you, starting with you, Claire, what advice would you give to people listening to politicians, consuming, particularly on COVID, obviously, uh, what advice would you give to people looking at their, 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 on their WhatsApp groups or on Facebook or Instagram, what, what advice would you give people to try to find a way in, in this whole infodemic of, around this disease? What, what, what advice would you give them to, to try to deal with it? Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is that we need to talk to each other about how little we still know about this. So if you read a headline or you read a post that suggests something, you know, affirmatively, I would just ask people to be skeptical in that sense. But I would also ask people to think about using emotional skepticism. So as humans, if you read something and it makes you angry, it makes you cry, it makes you want to purchase something in an impulse, like that means that that's when our brains just are not critical. And that in this, I always talk about, you know, I love cookies. If I have six, I'll go for the seventh. And then I was like, no, my tummy has not had time to tell my brain that I do not need a seventh cookie. And that's what we need to do with information. I think if we say to each other, yes, you know, yes, check the headline, blah, blah, blah. But actually the most effective way is to say, check how you are responding to a piece of information emotionally. And we should have a responsibility to talk to all of our family and friends about this. Doesn't matter, this is affecting everybody. Um, and I think we can't shy away and just mute our family if they're being, they're being, they're sharing conspiracy theories. And also, I think, I mean, one thing I say to people is, what's the rush? You don't have to share, instantly share. There's this kind of gratification of look at the headline and instantly share. Alice, what, what advice would you give to, to people? I mean, obviously, the platforms are a great, a great way of sharing good information as well, as, as well as bad. It's not all dark, but I mean, what advice would you give to people looking at your platforms and, and how to, to process this information, to try to process the good from the bad? Yeah, I think first is I would like uh, to encourage everyone to check out the authoritative, authoritative information that is available on the platform, the COVID Information Hub. It's got essentially all the useful things that people need to know to get through this pandemic. Uh, secondly, to report when they see what, they, what might be false news on the platform or any other harmful content on the platform because people's reports actually help us to train our uh, machine learning to you know, let us know when there is problematic content on the platform. And third, lastly, I just want to uh, extend uh, to Kristen, if you need uh, any help, any support with Marked by COVID, uh, please let me know. 
<laughs> Thank you. Kristen, last word. Um, you've been through this nightmare. I mean, what would you say to people uh, looking at, at the uh, their social media feeds? What, what advice would you give them? I would say that, you know, if you, part of what's given me a lot to stand on the last few weeks is just being honest and sharing the impact that this has had on my life. Uh, far too often, either leadership or policy or misinformation becomes private grief. And by being public, I have helped shine a light on the real human impacts of this. And so I would just welcome others who have experienced, you know, what I've experienced or something of, you know, some negative impact or outcome to be honest with that. Because I think if we start to engage one another, it helps to ask the questions of, well, why is this happening and where did it come from and how do we fix it? And um, we'll be posting this video online and also a story. So we'll put a, a link to um, Mark COVID on it and also um, uh, first draft, Claire. So, so very good, thank you, a big subject. And I think it was very important just to, and I really appreciate you all coming in particular, Kristen, it's very difficult, but I think it, what you're doing is very important because it, it turns something that is kind of a abstract into a very real life uh, situation. So thank you again. And uh, all I can say is thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.